My name is Sean Adams. Um, I run my own market research and strategy company called The Seed. In the past, maybe there was an element of research trying to uh, almost catch people out and sort of find out discreetly what they really think. Whereas I think nowadays there's far more awareness of research and far more awareness of its role in the marketing process. So I don't think it's necessary to hide the fact that you're doing research and to hide the reasons why you're doing research. To me it's, it's more a case of involving the people that you're talking to in the process. It's harder getting access to these people than getting access to more, to use your term, to, use more, uh, to more mainstream consumers. Uh, and it just requires often a more lateral approach. Uh, I think maybe talking to them in their environments uh, and also involving them a bit more in the process. There's something that we call is um, the beer interview and that's when you, you know, like you'll meet someone out and you'll, you'll talk and you'll basically interview them in a social setting and that is so much more rewarding than if you have to interview them you know, over email or something like that because when someone's in their own personal space you get so much more out of them. My name is Sonia Sharma. I am one of the editors of 3 Day World magazine which is a dance music magazine in Sydney. I'm also studying law and journalism on the side. I actually went to a clairvoyant the other day and I, I came to her with this issue saying look I work in the dance music industry and I'm always conscious of the fact that I'm not changing the world and she gave me some really good advice and she said you know there's the news and then she's and then there's dance and there's something really important about dance to society and you shouldn't devalue what that means to people and what you're doing is really important people need to dance and they need to hear about it and you know that's no less valid than someone who works in law or in some other profession and those words are really heartening to know, you know, like that what we do in this industry is important to people, whether it's just, you know, making them smile or give, giving them like a different political paradigm, that's really important. This is an interesting example of um, corporate sponsorship and how sponsors, if they understand the mindset of the, the, um, of the, of the people involved, they can actually do so in a, in a far more credible way. Um, an example was a particular clothing brand who were approached by um, a young filmmaker who got this great idea for a film, basically didn't have the funds to finish it, wanted to finish it, wanted to be able to screen it, wanted to be able to enter it into some awards. Uh, this particular brand recognised the potential of the filmmaker and basically gave him some funds, gave him the funds that he needed in order to finish his film. However, and here, here's the twist, what they, what they did is they said, look, we don't want any association with this. We don't want you know, our brand, this, this movie brought to you by, we don't want our logo associated with it in any way. Which is kind of quite contrary to how companies typically approach the whole area of sponsorship. And what was interesting was that once it was produced, the filmmaker himself, the film was, the film was a big success, and the filmmaker himself um, told all his friends about what a great organisation this was. And from a word of mouth point of view, the positive publicity that the brand got was way in excess of if they just insisted on getting their logo up large on the final screen. So to me, that's a, that's a great example of how a, um, a switched on company can approach the whole area of corporate sponsorship and be embraced by the society that they want to appeal to by being very subtle, by understanding the mindsets and not trying to be heavy handed and force their brand down people's throats. My name's Natalie and I work for a company called Heartbeat. We're a social trans research company based in Sydney. I've been working with them for the last year and a half or so. Um, and I'm primarily responsible for um, two monitors, the teenagers and what we call literati, which is um, 18 to 35 year olds. Where corporate sponsorship is inappropriate, I guess, is where it tries to pretty much take ownership of an event. For instance, quite a few years ago, um, there was the example where Ericsson basically took over Homeland and, you know, gave the impression that everyone was there for Ericsson and it's got nothing to do, that's not what it's about, it's about the music and it's about the actual festival itself. Um, and I guess it's when corporations take, the way that they actually take on sponsorship and corporate sponsorship is um, what influences whether or not 
it's good or bad. I mean, they're there to facilitate the event and to make it better for people in a such a way, perhaps in a way where it's not obvious that they're sponsoring it. It's like amazing, like it's, the intent is um, a lot more subtle. It's ultimately showing some respect for the culture or the scene itself um, and becoming uh, a part of it without trying to own it. Well, the right reasons for being involved with sponsorship, I mean, everyone accepts that companies exist to make money and we all can appreciate that. Um, in terms of the ways in which companies get involved in sponsorship or get involved with youth culture is for it to be in a way that it is sim symbiotic and it's um, more honest and respectful towards both individuals in the um, engagement. Taking the example of, um, let's say, a, a jeans company sponsoring a band, uh, to me it's more authentic if the, the deal is done and the sponsor gives the band members and their friends some pairs of jeans and that, that's it rather than as part of the sponsorship deal saying right, every time you step on stage you must be wearing our jeans because to me that is a case of being told what to do um, as opposed to being provided with um, provided with product and it's up to you what you do it and I think there's also probably a greater sense of um, it's a greater sense of wanting to do the right thing by your sponsor if you're not forced to do it. My name's Pam I'm an account manager at Spin Communications I work in the um, marketing and more focusing on the advertising and promotions department. I look after Wrangler Jeans, who we do the advertising, the PR and the promotions and the sponsorship for. At the moment um, with Wrangler we're doing, we're basically looking at two different areas of things at the moment. Um, we're doing sponsorship of um, fashion, which is much more of a traditional kind of sponsorship where we're um, sponsoring or providing all of the volunteers' uniforms for Fashion Week um, as a branding exercise, getting it out there. Um, also, what we're doing on a much more grassroots, fairly basic level is um, we're getting, um, we're offering jeans to um, musicians in biggish bands and the more up and coming rock and roll bands. Basically, it fits with, um, we think it fits with Wrangler because. Um, Wrangler's always been a cowboy brand, started in 1947, and it's always been about kind of cowboys and rocking along and getting a bit dirty. And as far as cowboys go these days, that's kind of the same attitude that we see in musicians. And so for that, we think it works. And what are you physically doing? We're sending out, um, we're going to find out um, sizes of um, selected um, musicians in selected bands and um, send them out a um, pair or two of jeans and they can wear them or they can not wear them. If, you know, if I was in a band and, and Lee offered me jeans to wear, I would probably wear them. Um, I don't know, actually, I don't know, actually, that's probably wrong. I think it would have to be a grassroots approach um, for, an art, for a corporation to have any credibility in the eyes of people working at an underground or alternative level. You, I mean, you do need to position yourself as doing something grassroots that's going to help them. So that must, it has to go beyond purely money and fostering a culture beyond that. And but to do that, I think it's very hard for a corporation to do that because they necessarily sit outside of that sort of that sort of paradigm anyway. But by offering something at a grassroots level, by sponsoring, say, a band competition, that's you know that the promo isn't out there in a big way but they're just merely supporting it because they genuinely believe it's a good cause, then I think that's, a, that, then I think that's valuable. Brand seeding is planting uh, a product or something um, in a more grassroots way, I think built on the acknowledgement that uh, our generation um, won't, will rarely succumb to television advertising or magazine advertising. Um, people even believe that flyers and stuff now don't really work either. There's this way of like getting hold. And I think seeding is to do with working um, 
treating uh, how ideas or products couldn't carry virally, as in from one person to another. And so, uh, um, what I guess, have you done with it? Um, I have um, been given um, pairs of shoes and uh, jumpers to wear for different companies um, and to wear them out and about. Um, Did that work? Well, I do actually like the product, so I think um, it works. Um, like I had a pair of sneakers and I had, um, yeah, clothing outfit for different companies. But if you like the product, it's always going to travel. It's just like, um, you know, good word of mouth or recommending things. It's effective when the individuals who wear it do genuinely believe in it and it's something that they would choose to wear themselves anyway. It's something that we use all the time, yeah. but you have to do it well, you have to make sure that if you're going to give someone a product that they're actually going to want it and wear it otherwise mm. it's totally useless. It's a total waste of time and money, not so much even the money in giving the stuff but your time in compiling things and getting through to people and finding people. If, you've got, if you're not targeting it properly to people who want it, who it's going to work for, then yeah, it just somebody gives a t-shirt to somebody else and that's What's it. What's a good example you can think of a brand that you've done that's been effective? Um, like passing off jeans labels to bands and skateboarders and break dancers and whoever it is. It's almost like mm. the same group gets everything over and over again. But like I said, it's just a, you just have to get a, the match between the brand and the person so it's actually going to work for the person as well as the brand. And if you can do that, then it'll be effective. Mm. Because they'll, you know, they'll love it, they'll wear it out and people will see them and that's the whole point of doing it. So it's just a getting it right. We got lucky that time as well. A couple of years ago, um, mm. we were looking after dome bikinis, and um, they, we we got wind somehow that Britney Spears was going to be in town for the weekend, and so we just thought, why not just send her a dome bikini? And she wore it to Bondi that weekend, and she was splashed over, you know, international papers with Britney Spears wears Ken dome bikini. It's like having a spokesperson, but they never actually say anything. They just wear something or do something or have something. You don't want him to say anything. Hi, I'm Tim and I'm a sound engineer. <laughs> for Machine Gun Fallacio. I have been endorsed by Converse Australia to wear their shoes. I'm not supposed to do ads or anything, they just give me free shoes when I want them. Oh, these are actually different <laughs> shoes. <laughs> As you can see, I'm not in ads, they give me free shoes. Why Every four months I pick them on the internet. Why they do come you, in the mail. Why do you think they chose you to give free shoes to? Because I work with a band that are somewhat notorious. For what? For their crazy antics and their crazy, the cabaret lifestyles. Okay, and do you think Converse want to be affiliated with that as a theme? Um, I think the guy who manages the band hassled them that much that they were like, alright, we'll give you shoes, cool. Oh, so the band asked for them? Oh yeah. Why did the band want Converse? Well, they didn't care what shoes they had, they just wanted free shoes. You can't ever show this tape to my mum. I think I probably bought about 160 or 170 pieces of clothing in the last 10 or 12 months from eBay alone and then I don't know a lot more as well as from around town but I'm a mad fiend I'm a mad addict I've got um, I've got we live in Balmain my house is totally full with clothes there my parents house in the mountains is full with stuff and I just take stuff up and swap it over on exchange program so I give you know some t-shirts a rest to bring others down and things like that I think it literally is an addiction now and everyone's on my back about it trying to get me to go to Glebe markets and sell up all my shit but I just won't do it because I'm a hoarder and I can't let stuff go and when I was in year 8 I went to the iced tea concert and I got the best iced tea tour t-shirt ever and my mum made me gave it away when I was um, probably in year 11 and I've regretted it so much ever since then I wish I still had it. Hi my name's Axel and I work here at Speed Communications this is my showroom this is my area. and I do a bit of this so it's I look after all these fashion labels here and then I also do some more corporate PR stuff for clients like eBay. So what do you reckon of eBay? Uh, I love eBay as a thing. Sometimes the client itself can be a bit more trying, but um, as an actual entity, I, I'm totally immersed in it and addicted to it. And I'm constantly running to the mailroom to see if a package arrives from the United States with a T-shirt in it or some such thing. So I love it. I love it.
do you think eBay is quite symbolic of the way of informal economies and how people are relating to each other? Um, yeah, the, it's it's quite an interesting uh, client to have because they they sort of aren't. Um, they're just basically a meeting ground for two people to go. One person's selling something, the other person's buying it, and they're just doing it on this platform known as eBay. And so they have all these um, sort of corporate culture ingrained into them that everyone is basically good and, you know, the world is great and blah, 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 blah. And um, they just let everyone do their thing, but at the same time, they're extremely corporate. And they have to be, like, they're the fastest growing company in history. And they've got 105 million members around the world now, and they're making squillions of dollars. But they like to sort of present this face that we, you know, it's all just you guys, it's all about the community, but on the back end of that is just the most monolithic corporate beast you could ever see. And I think that is kind of a reflection of where corporate culture is going. They like to um, be part of the people, but at the same time, there's a big machine behind it how enmeshed it is in today's society and that the lines between um, culture and commerciality are so undefined, I guess, yeah. in some ways. So, um, I mean, I guess that whole concept of selling out like, is harder to define, you know, because of that in some ways. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so do you think those examples, do you think in the 90s mm. the concept of selling out was much more binary and it's become more fluid yeah. now? Yeah, definitely. Um, it was a lot more binary in the sense that corporations were over here and politicians were over there and um, youth culture was, you know, in another place. I mean, and if you look at just the punk movement per se, I mean, it was scary, it was extremely anti-establishment, whereas, um, you know, nowadays youth culture is so enmeshed with consuming as well, but it's not as threatening to corporations as what it perhaps was even with grunge, which was quite um, anti-consumerist in terms of what it represented. Um, whereas nowadays, and, and part of it is a process of... Um, consumer goods becoming so attractive and so um, seduce, seductive um, that that enmeshing has occurred as well um, and you see the process of commodification happen so much faster now as well and it's operating in so many different cycles that it's not um, linear. I think I've always positioned myself in outside the mainstream because I guess that from a very young age I was politically uh, politically aware and that sort of took me outside that domain musically and socially and politically and culturally. And also I think being, being ethnic does necessarily place you outside the mainstream for some degree and so I think I've always placed myself outside of those barriers. I think mainstream or any form of uh, social norm is just it is only a concept that people use to bounce off as in through dis defining themselves as something other than or something within. I think that's kind of what the mainstream is, is accepting what's fed to you rather than deciding and defining what you want for yourself. I suppose mainstream is kind of a dirty word because we try to be at the leading edge and when, if you get to mainstream then it's, you know, it's success. So then you have to go back to the front of the bell curve again and manage it. See, I actually think that, that was true more a couple of years ago than it is now. I think things that have happened in the past where mm. I think for us having been teenagers in the 90s where a lot of things that were considered mainstream at the time and that were popular musically, mm. fashion wise, that kind of stuff, were pretty shit that um, you really didn't want to be associated with it. But um, these days, I think it's almost returning to the 80s where it wasn't bad to be popular. Mm. I think people yeah, like right. Pharrell Williams, yeah, totally. Justin Timberlake, <coughs> The Strokes, The White Stripes. Mm. In the 90s, it would have been impossible for a band like The White Stripes to maintain credibility and be that big. And similarly, I, I mean, The Strokes suffered a bit of tall poppy syndrome, but the way... Um, I think you, you can be mainstream now and it'd be okay. Mm. I think we'd like to think we're less mainstream than we are. Exactly. <laughs> we're doing all the exact same things that everybody else does, but, but we, it's packaged yeah, it's, it's slightly different. again that come off like the bell curve. It's just like, 
Oh, because I'm wearing like a hooded jumper by Pam. You know, that separates me from someone that's wearing a hooded jumper by Rusty. They're the mainstream and I'm the leading edge. Yeah. You know, and but fuck, we're both wearing hooded jumpers. What's the difference? It's true. And where we go out, like, we, we end up going out to a lot of places that um, mix in a lot of old stuff and you spend your time listening to a lot of retro stuff, a lot of stuff from the 80s. You spend your time sitting in seedy bars, um, talking an absolute load of nonsense. And the fact that, like, a lot of the time, people who claim not to be mainstream would look down at somebody who goes to the city to, you know, a big bar like Jackson's on George and spends the night dancing to Michael Jackson and drinking beer and, you know, talking shit with people that they either don't know or have just met. Whereas the fact is that if we went to Bang Gang, Death Disco, The Judgment Bar, any number of the places that we go usually that are supposed to be maybe cool, you'd go and listen to Michael Jackson talk shit to people you've just met. Exactly. The same thing. It's exactly the same. Mm. I don't know what mainstream is anymore and I definitely don't know what irony is anymore. The whole thing, irony, dressing with irony is completely blurred recently, I think. You know, to go out in... um, I don't know, just a really, really bad cropped um, sort of early to mid 80s uh, checkered jacket. Um, I don't know, a year ago I would have worn it because it was slightly ridiculous and cheeky, and now I actually think I do like it. So I think the idea of irony is totally blurred. Or well, some days I think I'm just wearing like, you know, high waistband um, dark blue denim jeans with white Nikes and a hoodie and I realise I'm completely subscribing to a Jerry Springer look or something. Mainstream and the underground, those notions are actually being blurred at the moment. Like An act like, say, Justin Timberlake, who's performing tonight, would never be seen as cool a couple of years ago. And now it's like you've got underground cats who are going, yeah, Justin Timberlake. Well, I'm going to the Justin Timberlake concert. Yeah. Sponsored by McDonald's. For an artist like Justin Timberlake, who clearly doesn't need money to be sponsored by McDonald's, to me seems wrong. Selling out is not just about um, acquiring a whole lot of money very easily, and um, and that's it. Selling out is bigger than that. I mean, it's selling out on your principles, or selling out on. Um, what it is that you stand for as an individual. Selling out is what happened to Face magazine. It used to be a really credible source and then its editorial and advertorial direction completely changed. People recognise that and it's gone under. I'm Anthony Wooden, I'm a graphic designer. I was reading an, an article the other day about uh, Ajax who does the uh, bang game parties and um, he was talking about selling out because he's gone kind of mainstream and is playing at home nightclub and um, I thought that was was really interesting because he was just saying that he's using that to pursue his like you know financial career and uh, that type of thing. So I mean, it's not necessarily selling out if you're still doing what you believe in, but I suppose selling out is um, when you're no longer doing what you want to and not uh, pursuing the creative endeavors that you want to just to make money. And I think that's selling out. Um, I think you should take advantage of it as much as you can because it can allow you to like create stuff and put it out there and you know pursue the ends that you want to without you know pulling it off your own back like you know getting people to sponsor you without alcohol so you can put on a, a show or um, that kind of thing is fantastic and um, I mean we spoke about to you the other day with Car and about how you know, I would like to get sponsorship by the people that I'm taking the piss out of, basically. So, with the TVSN thing, like, get them to actually sponsor us. Um, I think that would be quite cool, just to, you know, get them to pay for my entertainment of, sort of, um, researching a subject. Elle is a really good networking tool, actually. She, um... She has her fingers sort of out there, and that's good for me to kind of, like, often tag along with her to things. And um, being a lot more extroverted than I am, it sort of helps with, uh, you know, meeting people and actually sort of getting getting contacts that way as well. The lines between professional and uh, social are pretty blurred as well, um, both in a lot of my different networks 
of friends or through my network of friends. Um, there's, there's always people that you know you can get in touch with or it's a sphere of people that, you know, can always help you out with stuff and, yeah, so it's good to bounce off those things as well. My name's Ella Barclay, I'm a researcher in new media theory and uh, occasional art organiser and um, general kind of ditzy socialite. A lot of the research I'm looking at is to do with um, ideas of play and how that aids in people either learning or passing on information or um, sort of marketing things as well and I think play is definitely what compels people to um, their sense of style, the sort of music they research, um, how they present themselves because I think if you look at the, the qualities of what make up a game it's to do with elements of um, competition and chance and sort of simulation as well I think so in terms of my lifestyle being playful I think you know I engage in you know a lot of um, like music's a very big thing for me and I think that there's play involved in that in seeking out new music and finding new music and then showing it to people and seeing if they like it and then exchanging it for you know other pieces of music clothes I think it's the same thing it's about sort of researching almost or finding things that you think are really unique or interesting and then showing other people and seeing what they've got and it's kind of I don't know um, it is quite playful in the sense of um, yeah, how we present ourselves and um, what we're interested in and then you know going out and seeing who you'll bump into and all those things I think are quite um, playful. There are very different pressures on young individuals than there have been in times gone by um, but coming back to the I guess the issue of protesting um, it's not necessarily the only indicator of involvement that people have and passion that people have for society I mean you see a lot of um, online activism or hacktivism where people, young people 16 to 19 years of age, are basically um, getting involved in online protests and they're finding that those types of things actually have more impact. If they're able to influence the share price of an organisation, um, then that's far more empowering than, you know, talking on the street and having a protest where, at the moment, because of our government as well, people don't feel as though they're getting hurt. So I think that plays a really strong role as well. But I think it's just more about being politically aware of issues and speaking up about them, you know, and even with fashion, like I'm, I'll, I'll wear a badge that says fuck Howard and I'll wear that out socially and then people comment on it. And I think, you know, you don't have to be politically um, intrusive to people but you can still express just your political views and it doesn't have to be banal it can be every day and it can be cool and it can be accessible to other people like I think that's really important. Do you think a lot of young people have got that attitude? I think what's sad is that they don't and uh, oh, I think they do and they don't like I think in the rock scene especially it's really sad to see that politics has kind of become it's become apolitical, whereas in, in a genre of hip hop, it's you know, politics is really talked about. But um, at the same time, I think like I'm on a lot of internet forums, and you know, political issues will get discussed, and I think that's a great thing. Like, uh, it's apathy really scares me with young people, and it's it's good to see that there's a lot of musicians or a lot of people who are socially aware and making that out there in in different ways, so people can consume politics in a different format. And I think that's really important. I'd like to consider myself to be quite politically conscious, although what I do with that is a different thing altogether. Um, there are new ways for political um, subversion that are coming out all the time in terms of like the nuka cards, um, um, people you know writing their war in the opera house and things like that. There are more cunning ways that are erupting in terms of uh, people being political, and I think a lot of it involves um, creative industries, like graphic designers, um, artists, musicians who are yeah, putting their politics into their art forms to try and get media attention, which is far more effective, I think, than um, protests or petitions. Honesty, integrity and transparency prevail at all times. Um, and if you're trying to market to a sophisticated individual, you know you're never going to succeed by doing anything that comes across as being 
contrived or unimaginative ultimately. Being on this side of the equation makes you, like if you are reading a magazine or something and you're reading editorial and they mention the brand, you're just like, oh, yeah, there's got to be placed, it's mm. not it's not just something that people say. So even I think when we read it more are, analytically. Yeah, when even when like an editorial feature is generally editorial and they're not just saying that they love a particular brand for whatever reason. Mm. I just can't I can't take it at face value. I just can't think oh this person just likes this product and is therefore writing about it. And it makes you just tear it all apart. Yeah. It's the same way, um, I think you you can't help having if you work in this kind of industry you can't help but look at it in a more train spotter kind of way. The same way filmmakers can't watch movies and mm. just enjoy them anymore. I suppose the only ads that I find really effective now are either really funny yep. or their product is just right on. Yeah. Uh, otherwise it's just faff. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Fucking clever or fucking simple. Mm. And nothing in between.